Thank you. Wow, what's up, Manchester? What's going down? Wow, you guys stopped the energy real quick. <laughs> I, uh, I love the United Kingdom. I love Britain. Because one thing about you guys that's very impressive, you have very impressive children. <laughs> like, they're very impressive. Like, I was in Belfast two days ago. Like, I'm on a, I'm I'm on a tour right now. This is kind of an impromptu taping. I'll tell you that story later. But... uh. So I'm in Belfast, just jogging around, looking at like 10,000-year-old cemeteries and stuff. And, uh, and these, this pack of eight-year-olds, and I say pack because they were a pack. They were animals, right? And they come up to me, and I'm, I'm used to like eight-year-olds being innocent and nice. And uh, this, their leader comes up to me and just goes, Are you seven foot? I can't talk like you guys. <laughs> That's how everyone sounds to me everywhere. This is how this is all real. He goes, "Are you seven foot tall?" And I'm like, "No, little buddy, I'm only six seven, but I'm still growing." You know what I mean? And I expect him to smile like a, a normal eight year old, and he doesn't smile. He just looks at me right in my soul, like he's like a grown man. And he goes, are you American? I go, yeah. He goes, what are you doing here then? Like he's basically checking me for papers at this point. <laughs> and now I'm kind of on my heels, you know. I'm like, uh, I'm doing a show. He goes, what kind of show? I go, I'm a, a comedy show. He goes, tell me a joke, funny man. <laughs> he's eight. And at this point, I'm like, oh, I, don't, I don't really tell jokes. It's like, I do stand-up. It's different. It's not really like jokes. It's like, and he goes, aha, a funny man with no jokes, boys. <laughs> oh, you're a funny man with no jokes. And I'm literally like, I have jokes. He's like, you got no jokes. And I just start crying, and I ran away. <laughs> so, yeah, you, your kids are strong. <laughs> All right, anyway. Um. I was getting on my plane. Not my plane. It was a public plane. <laughs> and, uh, and the flight attendant comes up to me. She just picks me out of the crowd for some reason, you know. And she's like, excuse me, sir. Except she talked like you guys. I was like, eh, duh, duh, duh. <laughs> Do you guys not like being made fun of? I always like British people because you guys like being made fun of. Are you guys offended that I'm like mocking how you speak? Because you sound retarded. But that's all right. Anyway, so, <laughs> so I'm getting on the plane, and this woman's like, excuse me, sir, are you willing and able to sit in an exit row? And normally, I wouldn't even be able to look her in the eye. I'd just be like, I think you have me confused with somebody else. <laughs> Baby, I'm no hero. But for some reason, I think it was hanging out with all those Scottish dudes with swords. I just had like an extra shot of, of confidence. And she was like, are you willing and able? And before she could even speak, I just go, you goddamn right I am. <laughs> and her eyes twinkled. And she smiled like a hopeful smile. You know, like we're going to be okay. And I'm like, yeah, we will. <laughs> and she goes and reprints the boarding pass. She throws away my coward pass. And then she comes back. And when she reprints it, that's when all the people start noticing. That's when things get uncomfortable for me. You know, everyone's staring, especially the children. Children are innocent. They're like, Mommy, is that the hero? And she's like, yeah, baby, I want to fuck him so much more than Daddy. <laughs> it's a true story. But I don't let that go to my head. Power corrupts, right? So I don't even listen. I just take my boarding pass. And I nod at the people. They nod back, you know. I, some people are weeping. One guy's whacking off. So as I'm walking onto the plane, people are already seated, and they look at me, they start being like, thank you. You know, they're trying to touch me. And I'm like, hell out of here. I'm like, I'm not here for me. Don't you praise me. I'm just a man here to save you people. And they're like, oh, everyone's getting so horny, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and then I sit in the exit row, and I finally feel comfortable. I'm like, maybe I've been a hero this whole time. I didn't even know it. Maybe I just need to be tested. 
And then I got so excited, I started ordering drinks. I was like, yeah, give me a couple shots. And uh, before you know it, I was blacked out by 30,000 feet. So it turns out I wasn't a hero at all. I would have been a giant obstacle. <laughs> if, if anything remotely went wrong, people would have died. Because I would have just been a giant piece of carbon in the way of safety. And everyone would have burned to death. But for a minute, I did feel like a hero. So fuck that kid from Belfast. When I was a kid, man, I, uh, I was a paper boy when I was his age. You know, I had a job. I was working. But uh, I, was, I was not, I didn't have that kind of confidence. Um, I, was, I was really chubby, really fat kid, big fat ass. <laughs> and my parents were like hippies. They didn't have a TV or anything. So my mom made our clothes and uh, she made my velour pants. So they were tight on my big fat ass. <laughs> and so I'm delivering papers in the winter, you know. <laughs> and I would have to knock on doors like a pimp trying to get a dollar, you know. But I, there's one dude I remember opening the door. He's like, I owe you a dollar. I'm like, yes. And he's like, I don't have it. And I'm like, but it's been like a month. He's like, he goes, I got a tip for you, bro. He's all tweaked out. Later, I realized he was on methamphetamines, but I did not know that at the time. <laughs> he goes, I got a tip for you. I'm like, what? He goes, pussy will kill you, bro. <laughs> and he just closed the door. And I have no idea what that means. I have no idea. But I'm like, what? I've just, it's stuck in my head forever, you know? Because I didn't know what that meant. I was eight. And, uh, but now I kind of do. I want to tell you a quick story. I, uh, I love reading about animals. Because animals are honest. They just are what they are. And I was thinking about evolution and how it happened. And I live in the uh, wilderness, like all these mountains. And there's always deer in my yard. And I'm looking at these antlers. And I'm like, what the hell is the point of an antler? You know, like, I understand, like, fins and stuff, but, like, why does that happen? And then I realized what happened. There were probably deer that had no antlers, and everything was super chill. You know, everyone's like, hello. <laughs> you know? And there was all these, the, everything was cool, and, and everyone was just like, I want to eat a little twig. And everyone's like, I want to try a twig. And there was no competition. Everyone's like, ha. Oh. And sex was very mellow. People were just, not people, deer. Deer would just kind of bump into each other and be like, ho, ho. And then they just, that was it. And they'd just eat twigs and bump and twigs and bump. And it was peaceful. And then, and then there was a genetic anomaly. Like one of the deer had this little nub on his head. And he was like, ho. And he didn't understand it. And he felt weird about it. But he was still eating twigs. And then he developed a plan. Because he really liked twigs. And so as all the deer were nibbling on the twig, he was just like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some, something crazy. And he just goes, bam. He, and he hit another deer with his little nub. And everyone was like, oh, what's wrong with Bernard? <laughs> <laughs> and so all the male deer were all huddled up. And they're like, he's, oh, he eats all the twigs. And Bernard's just like, you know. And so all the women are like, oh, look at Bernard. He's got all the twigs. So he gets all of it. He gets all of it. He gets all of it. And so the next generation of deer all have that nub because they're all children of Bernard. And then that goes on. It goes back to mellow twig eating. And then another one pops up. Boom. That guy gets an idea. Da -da. Oh. So that keeps happening over and over and over again until these antlers just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I learned about a species. <laughs> this is a true story. I learned about a species of deer in Ireland that their, their horns got so big that they, they couldn't even keep their head up. And they started dragging their heads on the ground because their horns got so big that they couldn't even lift up their heads. So they starved to death. They went instinct. And that is how pussy will kill you. <laughs> thank you. Hey, thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm glad you like that one. I, uh, getting, uh, getting married is cool because that's the first time you ever really know a woman, I feel like. Because uh, you can't leave, and everyone knows that at that point. <laughs> so, you know, all cards are revealed. And, uh, and I dig it because you don't really know a woman until you watch her watch the show Snapped on the Oxygen Channel. 
And I, I, you guys may not have that in England, but you have something like it. It's a show about women. They're true stories. They're documentaries about women who murder their man. You know, like wives with knives, women who kill. You know, there's a bunch of these shows. And I'm fine with the shows, but it, watch, watch your woman watch the show. Because some of the murders I understand. Like, I'm no murder prude. You know, I've been, I've been to Scotland. <laughs> Some of the murders I understand, women get cornered, they have no way out, they have to do what needs to be done, I get that. But some of the murders are, you know, it's like Tina had to move because Brian got a job and she missed her mother. So she got into online gambling and then shot him in the head while he was asleep. I'm like, Jesus. And I look at my wife and she's like, that's what happens. I'm like, are we watching the same show? Like, you think that's a valid series of events? They moved 20 miles. And then she shot him in the head. She's like, she missed her mother. Do you not love your mother? I'm like, how is that what we're arguing about now? So that's when I felt fear. Because if she felt Brian could die, I could die for a million things worse than poor Brian getting a job 20 miles down the road. So that's when I had to figure out how to not die. And I, and, I, and I cracked the code, and I'm ready to report. <laughs> this is the deal. There's no right or wrong gender, it's just different. Okay, this is why people fight all the time, I think. Men need orders. Tell us what you want. We're here to serve. Our purpose is purpose. That's why we're on the planet. We can't make life, but you can't reach the top shelf. You know what I'm saying? So. Tell us what you want and we'll do it. Just use very clear language. Be very specific. Tell us what you want. We're in. We'll do it. Women are the exact opposite. They, they, it's not about motive. They want to do great stuff for you. Women are awesome. Unless you use very clear and direct language. All right, I'll give you some examples. All right. So my wife and I are sitting on the couch and, um, and she's like, it's really cold in here. I'm like, I know. And I did know. I've been cold before. And then I went back to wondering why glue doesn't stick to the inside of the glue bottle. I'll be honest, I still don't know. And, I, and I'm happy, I'm peaceful, you know? That's what I'm feeling at that point. From that point on, we're having very different experiences. You know, out of the corner of my eye, she's like <sighs> <laughs> And the chattering gets pretty loud, but that's not her fault. That's an involuntary reflex to cold, but it is annoying, so I turn the TV up to drown it out. <laughs> After a while, she gets up, grabs a blanket, sits back down. In my mind, I'm proud of her. I'm like, that's really smart when you're cold. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of that. Man, she's really smart. And I go back to thinking about glue. At that point, she's now thinking, of, she's, she's, she's overthinking what just happened. She's replaying events in her head, coming up with new conclusions. And about an hour later, which to me is completely out of nowhere, she just goes, do you even care about me anymore? <laughs> and then I react the way all men will react forever with a face that's like, baby, what the hell are you talking about? And she's like, you don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm like, you sound crazy. You think that's crazy? Now you're fighting and you have no idea why, right? So my point is, fellas, they're all like that. So if you have a good girl that you love, stay with her. Don't ever leave anyone. There's nowhere to go. <laughs> when I was younger, I thought there were options. I thought that I could bail and find something else. You know, I get with a chick and I'm like, man, I got to get another girl. This one's crazy. And I get with another chick and I'm like, what are the odds that this one's also insane? And I get with another chick and I'm like, is, am I being punked? Like, why is everyone I'm dating like legitimately insane? And then that kept happening until I realized something. Being, the definition of insane is actually doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. That's what I was doing. I thought if I got the right girl, I could find one that wasn't like a girl.
That's not what it is. Being a man is dealing with that. Being a man isn't being with a ton of women. That's actually like a trail of defeat. You know, being a man is looking into the eyes of someone you know should be in an institution. <laughs> and not reacting to her words and not leaving her and just being confident. Because once you do that, once you go through that, you realize women aren't even crazy. What it is, I got some info. I got some, I got some magic. What it is, is women think an observation is a direct order. That's the whole problem. They speak, like when a woman says, it's really cold in here, they expect us to be like, what makes cold? And then we solve a riddle. <laughs> it's literally a riddle. It's a code. It's cold in here. It's like, hmm. that's not how men think. We can never think like that. If we start acting like that, things go horribly bad. I had a pretty good day. You want me to kill your boss? We have no idea. <laughs> Because men don't talk like that. We, track, we talk very directly, task-oriented, problem-solution, blowjob. That's how we think. <laughs> Linear, right? Like if a dude's like, it's really cold in here. I'm like, yeah, it is, right? Seasons are crazy. I know. Seasons. Seasons. And that's it. There's no expectation to order. So she's reacting as if she told me to get a blanket. And I was like, no, I'm thinking about glue. Like, which she has a right to be offended at that point. Because that's how women talk to each other. You ever see women talk to each other? It's all this code, subtext, just all this mannerisms. You know, me and my wife would go to like, um, go to a dinner party and my buddy's wife comes to the door and it's like, oh, hey, it's so good to see you guys. Oh, you didn't bring any wine? That's totally fine. We have plenty. And we're walking in and my wife's like, that fucking cunt. <laughs> and I'm like, she was just very nice. Why are you upset at her? She She's like, she knows that we didn't bring any wine. She was digging at me right now. I'm like, you guys are legitimately crazy people. It's just this Game of Thrones shit all the time. And uh, we <laughs> women have more power than they realize. Women sometimes feel powerless, you know, but they're not. If you give us a direct order, we'll do anything you say. Like men want to be men. And, and to, this world is not made for men anymore. All the dragons are dead. You know, we're just sitting on our couch, just waiting for... Or something. You know, we're like, did I get a retweet? Oh, we have so much food. I have too much food. You know, we're just, we, just waiting. And then if, you're, if your girl's like, baby, I'm really cold. Will you get me a blanket? We'd be like, baby, if I don't come back, I love you. <laughs> and now you're on a mission. You're like, I got a cold girl back there that needs a big, strong man. And ladies, you really want to get us around your finger? Be like, Baby, you're so good at getting blankets. She sees something in me. I don't want to disappoint her. She sees something in me that no one else has ever noticed. I'm good at blankets. Then you go to the blanket area, and you don't want to disappoint her, any, you know? She respects you. So that means you respect her. You're like, what's the best blanket? I'm not just going to grab anything. That one's too thin. That one's too thick. That one, I believe, is still covered in semen. But finally, you got to be a man. You got to make the choice. What's the best blanket? And you take it with confidence. You bring it back and you put it around your girl and you tuck it in. And this is what we need in return. And this is very important, ladies. Don't just take the blanket and sit there because then we don't know if the task has been completed. And now we're in a constant state of agitation. You know, we're like, did she want the cum blanket? What the hell's going on? <laughs> and then eventually we're just like, we get insecure. You know, we're like, did I do good? She's like, yeah, baby, you're such a man. And you're like, I knew it. <laughs> And that would be fine if that was all it is. But that's not all it is. Women are the opposite. Women want to do stuff for you. They're insanely kind. And they're also insanely horny. They want you bad. They want to get on it bad. <laughs> Unless you tell them to. Then they don't. Ha! <laughs> and that's universal. <laughs> right? I'll, give you, I'll give you some examples. This is what you should... Unless you're ovulating sometimes. I don't know why I felt I had to say that, because I try to be really honest. There are like, uh, like one day a month sometimes. <laughs> anyway, so that's not part of the joke. I just didn't want you to not think that every now and then it... All right, whatever. So <laughs> this is what you should do, right? This is the best move you can possibly do. If you come home and your girl's there, be like, hey, baby, I had a really bad day. You look amazing. I love you. Don't say one more word. You just covered everything possible that you need to cover. Find a window and look out the window. Because <laughs> you 
because she'll notice you. And that's when she looks up to you. She's like, look at him looking out that window. I wonder what happened today. Why is he in so much pain? <laughs> you're not. You're still wondering about glue. You're like, is there a vacuum in there? Like, why isn't it sticky? But don't say that out loud. Just look stoic, right? And she's like, I'm going to do something good for him. He deserves something good today. I'm going to make him some hot cocoa. I know he loves hot cocoa. I'm going to feed my bear a little hot cocoa. You know, and she comes over with the cocoa and she's like, here, baby, have some hot cocoa. And I'm like, I forgot I even like this. How'd you know this about me? And she's like, because I love you and I pay attention to you. And I'm like, I pay attention to you too. And before you know it, you're inside of her, right? <laughs> yeah. And you're, you know, you're just right in front of the window. Let it happen. Right in front of that window. Let everybody watch, you know, but you're also holding a hot beverage. So you can't pump too hard. Okay, here's another scenario that's infinitely more probable. <laughs> that's never happened to me. I've never had sex holding cocoa. <laughs> no. <laughs> you come home, you're like, hey, baby, I had a bad day. Make me cocoa. You feel that in the room? You think that's my job to make you cocoa? I'm like, yeah, that is your job. Make me cocoa. It's like, you think that's my job? I'm like, yeah, and so is this. And you unzip. <laughs> Looks like somebody's got a double shift tonight. <laughs> it's time to clock in. <laughs> At that point, she'll take the cocoa. She'll burn your wiener with the cocoa. Now you have no wiener, no cocoa. You become your own Snapped episode, and women around the world go, that's what happens. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Good times. I'm from uh, northern New York, near Canada. It gets very cold, you know. And uh, winter and, and tasks keep marriages together, I think. Like my, dad, my, my mom, one time I asked my mom, I'm like, Mom, how have you been married to dad for 50 years? Like, the dude's legitimately insane. <laughs> and she's like, I can't shovel the driveway myself. <laughs> and I look at him like he's going to be pissed. He's like, dude, find a niche, man. I'm good at this. <laughs> Being a, being a dad's a good time. It, the one thing about, um, make some noise if you have kids. Where are the babies at? You guys are not excited about your own families. <laughs> it's British kids. They wear you down, huh? You're like, you think you work hard, dad? You're like, you're five. American kids are like, I just went pee-pee on my own pee-pee. I'm like, you're 30. <laughs> I picture every English kid just covered in like coal dust. It's like, hey, hey. <laughs> like they've just seen stuff. <laughs> Is that a union, Jack? Like you guys all have weird issues with yourselves. There's a weird thing going on with, with uh, you guys don't want to hear about it. That's all right. Let's move on. Um, I lived in in Los Angeles for 12 years, and LA is a good time. It was, it was fun, but it got a little intense, it got a little uh, exhausting, you know? Everything's about social outrage now. You know, and everything's gotta be some social thing, you know? Like my buddy's like, do you wanna go for a walk? I'm like, yeah, I'd love to go for a walk. He's like, for skin cancer awareness? I'm like, I'm like outdoors? I don't think he put together the, uh, the, the the irony of that. But he's like, yeah, dude. I'm like, yeah, of course I'll go for a walk with you, bud. And I, I wanted to become a very good walker. Because when you're walking for some sort of awareness, you got to really just impress people with how you're walking. Because I'm not just going to walk for awareness and not be good at it. I like to try hard at things. So I got myself a Fitbit from the Apple store. You know, it's this little thing you put on your wrist and it tells you how far you walked that day. And I forgot it was on my wrist. I masturbated. Um... <laughs> It turns out it takes me 1.2 miles to come. <laughs> if I'm hydrated. <laughs> Thanks. Anyway, because uh, Halloween is always one of my favorite holidays, but now white people have to really overthink their costumes and make sure no one's going to get super sad. You know? Like this year, I was going to go as a ghost with a pointy ghost hat. Because my whole life, I've loved ghosts and pointy hats. 
And I'm like, this is the year. Pointy hat ghost. And everyone's like, you, that's very insensitive. I'm like, tell that to the pointy hat ghost. He's dead and he only has one hat. It's pointy. They're like, don't do it. I'm like, okay. So I had to think of some other ideas. <laughs> All right, what was I talking about? Halloween? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so two years ago for Halloween, me and my buddy are uh, going out for Halloween and we did a, a, a costume together, like a two guy costume. And we got sombreros and mustaches. And uh, I was Jose. He was Hose B. <laughs> right? And it was exciting. You know, we go out, everyone's high five and Jose, Hose B. You know, we, 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 we wanted a third guy, uh, but we only had two sombreros because we wanted to have a third guy and be one direction. <laughs> right? And everyone's high five, we're having a great time. And then the same dude that had me do the skin cancer awareness walk is like eyeballing me. And I'm like, what's wrong with this guy? And he comes over and he's like, excuse me, excuse me. And I'm like, you talking to Jose or Jose B? Because we're in character. And he's like, I'm talking to you, Owen. And at that point, I know I'm in trouble, you know? I'm like, what's wrong, little man? I didn't mean that condescendingly. Little guys take that offensively sometimes. Like, no. I'm like, sorry. What's wrong, uh, small man? And he's like, you're wearing a sombrero. I'm like, yeah, that's what Jose wears. So does Jose B. Would you like to be in One Direction? <laughs> and he goes, that's, that's offensive. You can't wear that hat. That's not your hat, white man. That's their hat. I'm like, the hell are you talking about, dude? He goes, that's cultural appropriation. And I didn't know what that meant because I'm fun to be around. <laughs> <laughs> but I like learning new things. So I'm like, I looked it up. Looked up cultural appropriation, and it turns out what it means is when one culture adapts traits of another culture. You know, I always thought that was assimilation. I always thought that was a good thing. You know, when one culture is doing something good, it's like, I really like that. I'm going to pick up that too. And it's like, oh, no way, you can use this too. And I'm like, that's great. I thought that was the dream of humanity, you know, but not anymore, you know. But I look at him, and I was thinking about his life, and I'm like, but you drive a Subaru. That's a lesbian's car. You've appropriated the lesbian machine. He's like, that's not funny. I'm like, I'm literally not trying to be funny. It, everyone I know in a Subaru is a lesbian. I get it, sleek and beautiful, like a woman's body, but has four-wheel drive. I get it. But you kind of took it from the lesbians. He'd go, and he's like, take off the hat. I go, what? And I'm, I'm here to make people happy, but I'm not going to be a liar. I'm, I'm a comedian for a living. I like to make people smile for my entire life. Like, I, I don't want to hurt people's feelings. That's not why I'm here. But I'm also not going to pretend to be somebody I'm not, right? So I think about it. I'm like, should I just take off the sombrero to make this little, this little guy happy? And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm going to stand up right now because if anybody needs this big sombrero, it's the whites. <laughs> because we're white. And the sun is not our amigo. <laughs> and I know England knows all about that. We have white skin. We need, we need a big hat, right? And this is why life is so funny. This is why cultural appropriation is a good thing and a needed thing because the whitest, pastiest people on the planet historically have the smallest hats. And I think we all know who I'm talking about. The Jews. Jews have almost no hat. It looks like a joke. It's called a yarmulke. It barely covers a, a, a small bald spot. It looks, it looks like a swim cap for kittens. But these people are very white. And then these, these Mexicans with this beautiful brown skin have this giant brim. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, what we need is to sit down me Mexicans and Jews and, and, and have them agree to switch hats. And that is how we cure skin cancer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Think about how more effective that is than walking in a park. So, uh, when my wife was pregnant, it made sex weird. Because I, I was uh, an experienced man, you know? I've, had some, I've, I've met some people with some exit row 
stuff. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. But, uh, you know, I, felt, I always felt like I was sexually experienced. You know, I brought, some, I brought some good moves to the table with our relationship. <laughs> Except one thing you're never prepared for is, is pregnancy sex. Because you never, like, do that as a single person. Like, when are you, do you go out to a bar and you just end up banging an eight-monther? <laughs> never once! <laughs> so, w there was problems I didn't really... I didn't really see coming because it was the first time in our relationship where like I wasn't as in, I wasn't that into it, you know, and her hormones are, are flying, you know, and she's like, you know, let's get it on. And I'm like, what time is it? <laughs> she's like, why are you being weird about sex now? I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? I'm not at all. You are, you are. <laughs> and she's, <laughs> it's you, not me. It's you, not me. And, um, and she goes, do you think I'm, I'm, I'm fat or I'm ugly? or what? I go, no, no, you're beautiful. You look stunning. Legitimately, you look awesome. She's like, then what is it? I'm like, you, you seriously want to know? She's like, yeah. I'm like, I feel like, uh, I feel like my wiener's getting near the baby. <laughs> and I couldn't stop thinking about it. Every time we'd have sex, like, because when someone's pregnant and you love your woman and you you can't wait to meet your child you know you don't want to like pound you want to be like rock a bye baby on the truth you can be anything you want little buddy i'm gonna love you and i'm gonna take care of you and your wife's like you know and i'm like ah. um and i'm like i think my wiener's getting near the baby and and she just started laughing which i took as an insult <laughs> she's openly laughing she's like ha, ha, ha. i'm like what, what do you what do you mean you don't think it's getting near the baby? She's like, no, you're, you're good. You're good. And I was like, no, it's, it's, probably touching, it's probably touching his forehead. It's probably going past the baby. Like. <laughs> Just a little FYI for those of you that don't have children. When you watch your wife give birth to a baby, you realize your dick never mattered. Like a baby's head is like that big around. And the whole time I'm like, oh, thanks for pretending like there was something going on with my dick. Like that's literally insane. It's a thousand times bigger than my penis. But anyway, so she goes, go talk to your doctor. Ask him, ask him about your situation, your little conundrum. I'm like, uh, maybe I will. Maybe I'll go get a medical opinion. She's like, do it. I'm like, I will. Because I like my doctor. He's a good guy. So I go in. And I'm like, so doc, what's going on in there? You know, is my little boy dodging jabs or what? <laughs> He's like, what? I go, does he think there's an intruder that can't make up his mind? <laughs> Am I giving my kid dimples, doc? What's going on? Is my dick, is my dick getting near the baby? He just goes, no, no, you're fine. The penis does not come. It doesn't even pass the cervix. The penis, the penis doesn't come anywhere near the baby. And this is when things got uncomfortable. Because I try to not be, I try to not make generalizations or anything in life, but uh, my doctor's like a little Asian guy. <laughs> I know, right? You guys get it. So, when he, so I, I didn't know what I should say at this point, but I finally did. I go, Doc, when you say the penis, do you mean yours or mine? And he just looks at me, and without missing a beat, he just goes, it's funny you say that, because mine's actually bigger than yours. <laughs> and this dude's like 5'2", right? I'm thinking about it, I'm like, because this is such a power move at this point, because uh, he has knowledge I don't have. He's seen my penis, I've never seen his penis. He could be right, he could be wrong, I have no way of knowing, so I did what anybody in this situation would do, I'm like, all right, Dr. Kobayashi, let me see that, let me see that hammer of yours. Let me see what you got. And he goes, I can't do that. You could sue me. And I'm like, well played. So I started obsessing about it. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I'm like, is, does, he have a big, does he have a bigger wiener than me? You know, and I don't, I don't even care about wiener size. I just care about the fact that a man who's 5'2 and Asian could potentially have a bigger wiener than me. Like, even if it was like an ear or a foot, that's weird. Dude's this big. <laughs> so now I'm starting to get respect for him. I'm like, wow, check out the kickstand on that guy. But I needed to know. 
So one night late at night, I come up with something. I'm like, maybe we both are right. So I text him. I go, you've never seen mine hard. <laughs> because I realized that he's only seen my penis when it's scared and cold. <laughs> and I'm like, I got more to offer. You've never seen my mine hard. And my wife goes, what did you just text him? I'm like, he's never seen mine hard. She goes, why would you text that to him? That's crazy. I go, he knows it's not sexual. There's no winky face at the end. <laughs> and then I see three dots pop up like he's writing back. And then the dots went away with no text. And we've never talked again. Uh, so there, women need a lot of support, you know, but it's gotten a little overblown now. Right? People would talk about sexism all the time. I don't know if you guys have that in, uh, in Manchester, where it's just constant bickering and twi tweeting. Uh, just constant. Uh, you know, there's sexism against men as well. We just don't bring it up as often because we like to be fun to be around. <laughs> Like, I'll give you an example that's pretty funny. Have you ever thought about this? It's acceptable for women during sex to say deeper. You ever think about how funny that is? Because men are seeking approval. We're, we're, we want task. We want to know if we're doing a good job. Even when we try to sound dirty, we're like, yeah, yeah, you like that? <laughs> yeah, you like that? You like that? Yeah, you like that? Do you like that? Approve of that? Is that good? You like what I'm doing? Is that good? You like that? And your girl's like, deeper! And you're like... Yeah. Yeah, like that? You like that? You like that? She's like, deeper! You're like... <sighs> Baby, I'm running out of theories here. You like that? You know, it's like, ladies, you think we're holding out on you? The fact you say deeper <laughs> means you think we're keeping some dick for ourselves. That's exactly what it means. When you say deeper, that implies choice. That there's any way that th your guy is like, when you're like, deeper, and he's like, not yet. <laughs> deeper, no, baby, you can't handle that bass inch. I'm not withholding. I'm doing it for you. I don't think you can, it'll blow your mind. Deeper, no, 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 not till Christmas. <sighs> I have a whole thing planned. How would women react if we said tighter? Are you offended? It's the same fucking thing! <laughs> women would lose their minds. <laughs> they just, they'd start marching, ah, tweeting. Ah. But here's how awesome guys are. We're not offended at all. Keep saying it. Because it, it's at least it's a task. We think it's sexy, to be honest with you. You say deeper, we try and find a way. Deeper, we're like, all right, Captain, I'll trim some pubes. I'll lose some weight. I got another quarter inch in there, Coach. Just let me back in the game. Give me one more pump. <laughs> Ladies, I'm going to tell you something on behalf of all men. I'll tell you right now, we're going as deep as we possibly can. From our first pump to our dying pump. We give you people all the cock we have. And when I die, that's what I want on my tombstone. He gave you people every inch he had, every day of his life, and he died happy wearing a sombrero and mittens. Thank you. It's, a, it's an interesting time to be alive. I feel like... Uh, Younger people, the millennials, they don't really uh, care about us as much as like I, I cared about people 10 years older than me back in the day because that's where we got information from. Now with the internet, we're kind of cut out. No one cares. And I got information from people that they're never going to learn online. There's something about human contact, you know, when you just tell somebody about life. Like, for example, you're not going to learn on Google how to get out of a fight that you can't win. You know, you're at a bar, some dude tries to beat your ass. Where's that Google search? I'll tell you how to get out of that. If someone tries to beat you up and you know you can't win, you drop your pants and you start whacking off.
it works 100% of the time. Because a man who wants to beat your ass will not be a part of you getting off. <laughs> like, who's going to punch a guy whacking off? You're like, yeah, yeah, hit me, hit me. Yeah, hit me. It's like, Jesus, dude. The hell's wrong with you? It's like, no, no, come on. I need you to hit me. So, <laughs> not going to learn that. I, I have a whole song. I wrote a song for the millennials. It's called um, Advice for Millennials because... I don't think, uh, <laughs> my testosterone is still high from Scotland. <laughs> I don't think kids get to make as many mistakes as uh, I got to make. I'm in my mid-30s, right? And uh, when I was a kid, we just made mistakes because no one knew any better. My parents would just send us out. You know, I'm like seven. My mom's like, go play in the park. I'm like, you're not coming? She's like, no, you're good. I'm like, when do I come home? She's like, when it's dark. And she loved me. I'm not complaining. She's like, can't wait to see you. I'm like, you either. And I come home like five hours later. I'm like, I'm missing a tooth. <laughs> and she's like, what happened? I'm like, I just kicked a kid for no reason. And then he punched me in the face. And she's like, yeah, don't kick kids for no reason. That's a valuable lesson to learn before you get your permanent teeth. And I'm like, thanks, Mom. And I'd, I've never done it since. I don't kick kids. Except for that little Belfast kid I really want to kick right in his face. 100% true story. Anyway, <laughs> that's three days ago. So, but kids these days, they're scared all the time by the Internet. You know, CNN, Fox, whatever you guys have here. What is it? Like the, the Queen's Woods. <laughs> but they're just scaring you. 24 hours a day, internet. It follows you. <sighs> we had a half hour of news at night. Very chill. It's like, hello. In the news today, there was a kitten in, with a little yarmulke hat. <laughs> and it got rescued. We're still kicking ass and good night. <laughs> now it's like, it's just scary, and every parent now, I understand it. I understand being scared, you know, so I get it. You know, a lot of it's irrational, though. It's like, get inside, Timmy. Don't play in the grass. There's autism in that grass. <laughs> so, and I'm proud of my mistakes. All my mistakes have led to a very good life, a life I'm very grateful for. I've had really low times in my life, but I'm here right now, taping a special with my friends in Manchester, England, and um, yeah. <laughs> And, and I want the kids to not have to get molested or punched. I want them to just know certain truths, because there are true things in this world. And so, uh, so uh, here's a song. I stand behind every piece of advice. It's called Advice for Millennials. <clears throat> if he has a tattoo on his face, don't let him borrow your car. If a girl says she's bi, Assume that means bipolar Don't judge a book by its cover Don't judge a tablet by its shape Cause who would have thought Bill Cosby was bad And the good guy all along was Professor Snape <laughs> The most important decision of your day Is when to switch from coffee to wine and remember to look up from your phone sometimes They say all you need is love But first you'll need water, food, Netflix Homophobic dudes Secretly kinda wanna suck your dick <laughs> So true Drink a lot of water it feels like an orgasm when you pee You don't need more makeup, just smile Sephora can't fix bitchy There are no atheists in airplane turbulence But there's no God at the DMV And it's impossible to enjoy Grey Goose responsibly You don't need more money 
You need to buy less shit. When a girl makes a duck face, it's impolite to throw bread at it. Only serial killers have wind chimes. And remember to look up from your phone sometimes. Cheers. Thank you very much. I'm never going to be super rich, which is fine because of what I value, I think. Like, uh, I have friends who are insanely rich, <clears throat> and they, they don't seem, some of them are, I guess, uh, I don't know. But, uh, like, I have friends that are worth, like, hundreds of millions of dollars, and I'm always like, dude, let's hang out, man. Let's, let's, let's hang out. And they're like, no, I, I got to work, bro. I'm, come on. I'm like, bro, you, you won. <laughs> like, it's over. Like, what do you work for? You're, like, the richest dude I know. He's like, you wouldn't understand, man. You got to have a legacy in this world. And I, I can't even keep a straight face at that point. I'm like, well, what legacy, bro? You work for Wells Fargo. What's your legacy? <laughs> He's like, I want a legacy. I go, dude. Julius Caesar took over the entire world with a sword. What's his legacy? A salad. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> like, I don't get what people care. Like, they want to just build these stacks. It's like, dude, you know what you could do with that? Right next to Best Buy, we could open Pretty Good Buy. And just see what people did. Take a billion dollar loss. Who cares? We have a billion and ten. <laughs> do you guys not know what Best Buy is here? There's a few things that I felt, like DMV, you guys don't know, right? Do you guys not know Toyota? You do know Toyota? Oh, you guys are just being vicious little cunts. No, that's all right. So anyway, <laughs> I learned that word from the Scottish. Apparently, it's not as offensive as we thought it was. They keep calling me a funny cunt and then high-fiving me and then stabbing me. Anyway. I would do this commercial on national television if I was, like, ridiculously rich for no reason, just to see what people did. <laughs> I'd be like, <clears throat> this Christmas, give her what she has wanted. Oh, uh, real quick, I would hire, like, George Clooney to do it. I'd give him, like, a billion dollars. <laughs> this Christmas, picture George Clooney doing it. Can we get someone even bigger? I don't know. The Pope. <laughs> I would hire the Pope. And right as he started, he took off his big hat. <laughs> this Christmas, give her what she has wanted all year. Dish soap. Get that bitch back in the kitchen where she belongs. And that's where she knows she belongs. This November, when she goes off to vote, ask yourself, why does she get to vote? They didn't used to vote, not that long ago. And then there was a vote to see if they could vote that they could not vote in yet. How the hell did we lose that vote? This Christmas, give her what she's been begging for since the first time you made love. That final inch of cotton. When she says deeper, you touch her lips gently and you say, baby, Merry Christmas. And then he puts his hat back on. <laughs> that's not sacral. That's, that's fine. I'm not being, being mean about that one. I was raised Catholic. We, we didn't really know what, it, what, the, what was in the Bible because a lot of our masses were in Latin. Do you guys ever go to Latin mass? It's like, oh, Sam Rossi, oh, God, oh. And we're like, if I put a dollar in the basket, I go to heaven, right? They're like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, here's a quick one. This is called uh, driving, in, driving in Manchester. <laughs> My blinker's on. Please let me merge. My lane ends in 500 feet. I will be fine. 
He doesn't budge, but that's okay, I still have time. 300 feet, just let me fit. 100 feet, you piece of shit. Thank you. It's a good time to be alive, man. I'm trying. It's a good time to be alive. Um, I love music a lot. I, I love music. I love being at a bar. I just pound of beers, and when a good song comes on the radio, um, it unifies people. You know, it makes everybody that thinks there's differences. Where it's like, how do you feel about the Pope? It's like, how do you feel about the Queen? <laughs> That's literally how you guys sound. You don't even realize it. <laughs> what do you do at the end of the prayer? You say, the, the thing that we say? <laughs> Who's your football team? I'm watching that. I'm like, if that was real football, I could run full speed into your back. <laughs> no, I get it. Your football, it, it should be called football. You play with your feet. I know that we messed up in America. <laughs> but ours is just so violent. Uh, anyway. <clears throat> Uh, like you're at a bar and a song will just come on, it just unifies people. It's like, it's just like, it's out of nowhere. It's like, I got my first real six string. And people having a bad day are just like, <laughs> played it till my fingers bled was, was the summer of, right? That just happened. It just makes you feel like, yeah, remember those days? Yeah, and it's like, by most metrics, we're doing even better now than 1969, you know, but we still can reminisce. We're like, remember those days back before seatbelts? <clears throat> you know, good music. Um, imagine, this is how recent we've been doing good as a species. Imagine if that was a remake of this song. <clears throat> I met my first real black friend. We were working in a mine He was cool, but I think he gave me typhoid Was the summer of 1869 <laughs> Me and the guys from church Got a cough, four of us died I needed milk, so I took my horse A hundred miles, it was a very bumpy ride yeah. When I look back now the Civil War seemed to last forever We weren't given a choice But those were the best days of our lives Oh yeah Back in the summer of 1869 We were all like three feet tall from malnutrition, yeah <laughs> My mom had her 10th kid by 15 Dad only had one hand An Indian killed him in March That's when the government store landed yeah. When I look back now I probably shouldn't have eaten bricks of lead I can't remember anything Oh yeah, sing with me, back in the summer of eight. We barely knew what germs were. That's it. Thank you. I love being a comedian because uh, I get to make people happy for a living and, uh, and sometimes when I'm, when I'm just out, like randomly somebody will be like, yo man, your own Benjamin. I'm like, yeah, they're like, yo, man, you make me and my wife laugh, and she never laughs, dude. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's great. <laughs> and, uh, and then I feel good about that, and then they're like, this dude's like, yo, dude, I respect what you do, man. You're living your dream. And that's when I feel like a coward, because I'm like, I'm living my third dream, bro. Because this wasn't my first dream. my number one dream. This is my third dream. This is my backup, backup dream. I had other dreams. My first dream was to be a real musician. Like, I wanted to be a real, super serious ballad singer. Like, I want to be one of these guys, like...
right? I wanted to be Celine Dijon. <laughs> and, but the thing about comedy, it's like when you're really honest. That's why maybe I was a dick to you guys for a little bit, but that, that's part of the problem. Is when you're super honest, you can be a dick for like five minutes, but most of the time you're super funny. <laughs> Because I, I can't question my instincts because that's what makes me funny, right? So, like, when I'm honest, even when I was trying to be serious, people always laughed, you know? Like, they'd be like, dude, that song's so funny. I'm like, what was the joke, Dad? <laughs> because uh, honesty's funny. Like, here's a song I wrote about Titanic. It's called Titanic. <laughs> Women thought it was romantic when Jack and Rose sank on the Titanic. Even though there was clearly plenty of room on the floating thing for DiCaprio But he wanted to bail, so he let go She said, hold on, Jack He said, nah, I'm good He'd rather die than just float with her <laughs> Because she was pretty awful, man, let's see, think about it, I mean, she, uh she complained all the time about being too rich. And then she banged a complete stranger and then took him to dinner with her fiancé. <laughs> and, uh, and then this song, it's like, Every night in my dreams I see you. Okay, so for like the next 60 years, well, she was with a good man who settled down with her, you know, made her feel good, worked hard for her. She dreamed about DiCaprio's dead ass every single night. And the whole time, she, the, every day, her husband, Rose, Rose's husband, went to work and worked his ass off. She had a big, giant diamond. <laughs> and did she give it to her granddaughter at the end of the movie? No. That cunt threw it in the ocean! <laughs> God damn it, Rose! All these movies are like that. I like The Notebook, I guess. Twilight? Twilight was about two gay guys fighting over a girl with autism in the woods. <laughs> How does nobody see that? It's like, eh. it's like Edward. It's like, Edward. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's the first time I understood negative cultural appropriation. Like, imagine being an actual vampire. Like, you're, like vampires are monsters. And they're like, and they're watching Twilight, and they're like, when did we become faggots? <laughs> like, because the thing I don't understand about um, popular music is some people can't r write music, uh, which I'm fine with. Like, Coldplay, I love Coldplay, but... I do, I really do like Coldplay a lot, but I mean, what is this about? Look at the stars, look how they shine for you. And women and gay guys are like, me? Everything you do. And it was all yellow. You could have a team of scholars. They would have no idea what that's about, right? And then, but he's a good singer, great performer. Uh, but then you have guys that can write really well that can't sing at all, like Bob Dylan. Great writer, great writer. But no one wants to point out the fact he sounds like a bumblebee. <laughs> He's like, And how it helps most men want how it helps most men Everyone's like, oh my God. Yeah, to my friend. I'm like, what is going on here? And then I love the Beatles, one of my favorite bands of all time, right? And when they, and John Lennon, yeah, Beatles are great. John Lennon moved to America and we promised we weren't going to shoot him. <laughs> you know, he's, he's a wonderful man and he's a brilliant man and he was moving to New York City and we all promised. We're like, we will not shoot this guy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we ended up shooting him in the head and he died. 
We're, we're really sorry. You know? Um, but the more I think about John Lennon, I love a lot of his songs. Like, Mother is a great song, and uh, Jealous Guy, great song. Uh, but his biggest song that I've, I've watched on tape a quarter million people weep to publicly is called Imagine. And the older I get and the more I pay taxes and whatnot, uh, the more I rethink the lyrics of Imagine. And uh, this is me responding to Imagine from the audience as an adult. Imagine there's no heaven Then where's my grandma? It's easy if you try Why would I do that to her? No hell below us Then why don't I steal everything? Above us only sky But what about la luna? Imagine all the people I can only imagine like 200 things at a time Sharing all the world Great, can I have that white grand piano that you shot the music video with and I'll give you my toy piano? You first, you rich bitch You may say I'm a dreamer No, my dad says communist but I'm not the only one I hope someday you will join us No way, I got Manchester guns! <laughs> and the world will live as one Only if everyone's dead but you Imagine there's no countries Then why did you move to America and not Nigeria if it doesn't matter? <laughs> imagine no possessions I don't have to imagine, I'm an actual poor person you billionaire cunt <laughs> Nothing to kill or die for I'm starting to think of a reason and then fortunately someone took him out oh I'm sorry we're, we feel really bad about that it was not it was not it was not a good thing we're still we feel bad about shooting that little red commie I like Oasis more man Oasis is way better Manchester they're like an honest Beatles <laughs> Made a meal and she No, I threw it up on Sunday. That's so honest. <laughs> Made a meal and threw it up on Sunday. I've got a lot of things to learn. Humble, honest. Imagine I'm not a fucking liar. You fuck you! Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I got carried away. He was not... He was not a good man who killed John Lennon. John Lennon was a, a beautiful person and also probably trying to spread something called an ideological contagion. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Am I? You guys don't even know. So uh, this is how we're going to close the show. I, th th this has been a very incredible experience for me. And I'll tell you a quick story about why we're taping a special here and what's going on. I, uh, I opened for the Impractical Jokers here in January. Yeah. You know, we're doing, we did this whole stadium tour. I've known these guys since MySpace, you know? And it's crazy. Like, Joe Gatto, he literally, on this tour, I'm opening for him in a stadium, you know? He goes, because I, like, I was in House Bunny and stuff when they were, like, living on each other's floors. And he goes, dude, you're opening for us. And I'm like, I'm both proud of you and rethinking some of my life choices. <laughs> And, uh, but they're the best people on the planet, like literally just insane. And so I got introduced to the United Kingdom and, and Ireland and Scotland. <laughs> it's its own place. Anyway, um, and so me and another really close friend of mine that I, I met 
along the way and she's amazing and she was like, dude, let's just put together a tour. And I'm like, let's just do that. We can just do things. She's like, yeah, we'll just do things. So she puts together this tour. And then I'm one day I'm on uh, Periscope just doing uh, music and stuff. And I'm trying to raise money for my next, um, com- uh, my next comedy special. And uh, some dude just writes, he just goes, I'm not even going to try your accents anymore. <laughs> he goes, he's like, where can I help out? <laughs> And I'm like, dude, hugepianist.com. That's literally my website. It's like, how much do you need? I'm like, I got a while to go, but it's all good. He just goes, man, you're funny, dude. I'll just give it to you. Let's just do this. I'm like, what? I think he's joking. I think it's one of those Nigerian prince situations. <laughs> and he goes, all you got to do is promise me. He goes, Glasgow's been sold out already. He's like, give me a ticket. And like the amount of money he gave me to help with the special, um, I, I, I didn't even understand where he was coming from at this point. I'm like, you want a ticket? He's like, yeah. I'm like, bro, I'll let you bang my mom. <laughs> and so uh, I got him to uh, the Glasgow show, and then I brought him here. And I literally, I, we, we gave, he's got a couch. We gave him a couch. You see how, yeah, give it up for my, give it up for my boy, William, who's turned out to be just one of the coolest dudes ever. And... Uh, and you animals all have to sit in hard seats. <laughs> Not William. He's from Scotland. He'll give you shit and then he'll kill you. But, um, and I was, I was like, yeah, let's just shoot it. Because I didn't want to shoot it in America because I wanted him to be able to go to it. And uh, I'm like, yeah, let's, let's just do it on this tour. And so I'm like, which one should we do it at? I'm like, well, Manchester was a blast. And I do love frogs and I find buckets very helpful. <laughs> it was literally just that simple. And then we... We, we used what he gave us to just hire some people and we just are doing this and that's why life is awesome because that happens. Yeah. So, I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna close tonight is uh, my, my third dream. I don't need to do that. I've already done that tonight. I've already made you animals laugh. I'm gonna live my first dream because that, as a, William inspired me, to be just like, dude, just do what you want. He literally just goes, yeah, man. He's like, you, ma- you made me piss my pants, and I just want to see you do more stuff. And I'm like, that's, that's like how to live. And I'm like, so now I'm going to do it. All right, anyway, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you guys a song that I know you don't know, but I want you guys to pretend like I'm living my dream, like I'm a real human being and not just a clown. So I'm going to say the title of a song, and I want you guys to flip out. Like, like have energy. Like, pretend like you love the mother of your child. Like, pretend that this is the song that means a lot in your world. And I made this song, and I know it, you know, it's whatever, but let's, let's pretend that I'm real. <laughs> this next song, I promised myself I would never play it again. <laughs> but if we can go back in time just once, back when things were simpler. I'm not telling you guys how to be actors, but at this point you should be like, oh, no way. Because you know the song I'm saying. Come on, create, create a backstory. Let, let's try it again. I promised myself I would never go back in time. But if we can go back in time just once. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you remember this one. It's called Feel My Heat. Feel my heat, feel my heat deep inside you. Feel my heat, sing with me. Feel my heat, feel my heat deep inside you. Feel my heat. Okay, that was subpar. And it may be my fault. I've been doing that song now for a year and a half, and it has not caught on. (laughs) I turn on the radio every damn day, wearing my PJs, and I listen. Feel my heat coming on? My wife's like, here's some hot cocoa, baby, and I pound on her for a while. (laughs) It's the only thing that can get my brain good. It's just draining the balls of the poison, you know what I mean? (laughs) 
but I think I cracked the code. I have a brand new hit tonight. Anyway, so I'm gonna, I figured out that I just have to tell you guys how to react, and that way I can actually live my dream, because I'm never gonna be my first dream. I've tried and tried and tried, and everyone just keeps laughing and sucking me off. It's exhausting, man. I'm always dehydrated. I've not, I, haven't had, I haven't had cum in my balls for more than 10 minutes in 16 years. <laughs> that, that's not true. Don't leave anything in the tank on this one. If it isn't good enough, I will cancel my second show and I will fucking fight every one of you as I'm jerking off. This next song, I promised someone very special I would never play it again. Shh. But if we can go back in time just once, you may remember this one from back in the day. I barely do. It's called Feed the Bear. There's my fireflies right there, baby, yeah. Here we go. Feed the bear. Feed that bear. Deep inside you. Feed the bear. Everybody sing with me. Feed the bear. Feed that bear. Deep inside you, feed the bear louder. Feed the bear. Feed that bear. The big bear's honey. Way deep. The big bear scratches back on a big tree. Yeah, big bear's honey. I'm, I'm trying to stay hungry the whole time. I keep saying honey. One more time. Feed that bear. Big bear, big bear's honey. What the fuck? One more time. Feed inside. Feed the bear. Feed the bear. The big bear's hungry. Where do you feed that bear? Feed that bear. Thank you, Manchester. I love you guys so much. This has been an honor. Thank you for having me. And keep feeding that bear, baby. Yeah. Bye. I love you guys, man. It means the world to me that you guys came out. I'm Owen Benjamin. Good night. Thank you. Mwah.